Ah, no. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Those of you who are... Is this on? Am I on? There we go. Gather in. Those of you who are out, out in the foyer, gather in. Find a seat. And uh, welcome today. We're so glad to have you here with us today on this uh, very special day. And those who will be joining us in a little bit as well and those who are joining us online welcome to this uh, Sunday morning as we worship the Lord together today you'll notice things are a little bit different this isn't our normal setup in case you didn't know I don't do puppets you know on here so that's that's not what this is about but uh, I know you're in for a real treat today and I know you will enjoy it I, I pray that you'll be ministered to as well and because of that, things we've changed the, the order of, of our normal service um, agenda order. So you'll, in your worship folder, you'll find a, a sheet that has words on there to a song. You are the only king forever, or only king forever at the top of that. So if you want to get that out, that's the song we're going to be singing. Since, since uh, you can't see the screen from where you're, most of you, where you're sitting. So we wanted to make sure that that gets out there. That song that we're going to be singing. Also, our regular tithes and offerings. There is a box out there in the, in the foyer like we normally have. And you can put your offerings and tithes and offerings in there. So you can do that. Or, and then at the end of the service, we, we, we'll be passing the plates, our offering plates, for a love offering for Randy Davis. And we want you to make sure that you uh, pray that the Lord will speak to you to give what He wants you to give. This is... He does this full time, so it's not like his weekend gigs and that kind of thing. He does it full time, and that he just comes on a love offering basis. So we want to uh, make sure we we take care of him with that. So I know you'll do a great job there. But uh, also, um, our children, if you if you would like to stay here and, and watch the the artist and the service, you're welcome to do that. If you would rather go downstairs, those of you who want to go downstairs, we will have those available downstairs for that children's uh, children's church downstairs as well as the, the nursery as, so so that's that's that is there anything else I'm missing you can talk later I can talk later <laughs> I'll talk later until then I'll turn it over to to Susie and and Connie and myself and we'll lead you in worship would you stand with us and singing it's great to have everybody here welcome You are 
Amen. Isn't God good? All the time. time. Praise the Lord. Well, for those of you who are just joining us, the words to the song were in the bulletin, but you don't need that anymore. So, (laughs) that's all right. That's all right. Well, and like I said, we will be taking up a love offering at the end of the service, so you want to be prepared for that. That'll happen there shortly. Today, after the service is uh, our dinner together and we would like for you everyone to to join us downstairs if you're able we would certainly like for you to do that and then um, we'll have a great great time together downstairs if you uh, have your care card inside your worship folder if you're new with us today if you wouldn't mind just filling that out and dropping it in the box in the foyer one of the donation boxes that way uh, that is just with your information on there, it gives us a chance to respond to your visit to us with us today, and we'd appreciate that so very much. For this one more now on next, I think it's next Saturday, the 30th, right? 30th is the Young at Heart meeting at 5:30 out at Ron Ellis's house for a bonfire and um, hot dogs, roasting hot dogs and marshmallows. So, if you like bonfire stuff, and we got a farmer over here, so he can help. Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, they're laughing at me again already because I said, you know, the flames, the flames. They're going to be flames. You can, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that kind of thing. Anyway, thank you. So you, you. You got me, Luke, I tell you. You said I'd do it to myself. Awesome. There is a sign-up sheet in the foyer so uh, for that uh, young at heart to sit around the flames. That would be great. If, if you could join us out there, that would be, be awesome. Thank you so much. Well, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father God, we thank you today for Jesus Christ has risen in glory like a bright morning star.
to light up the darkness of our lives. And so we continue in celebrating resurrection power in us. Lord, may we, may we turn our faces to the sunshine of your love in him that in our lives we too might reflect your glory. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, and fill us with your spirit of love and power, I pray. Lord, we're, we're grateful today that you walk among us on earth, bringing life and hope. You, you help us to recognize, help us to recognize you, help us to be aware of your presence in our, here in our time of worship even. Enable us to stand alongside you in ministry of, of healing on, on the crowded roads of our world through the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you have not left us alone in our sin and despair, but loving us, you have brought us good news and you set before us the way of life. Yet we confess that we have failed to see the way in, in, in stubborn pride. We have spurned your mercy and your help. In selfishness, we have turned away from those who need us. We've allowed ourselves to be crushed by troubles as though Christ had not been raised at all. So forgive us this morning, Lord, for our faithlessness. And I pray that you would grant that we might know new life and hope in the spirit of the resurrection. I pray that, Lord, you would add your blessing today on, on this service and on Randy Davis as he comes to minister to us through his words and through his art and his drawing and may we be drawn into a closer relationship with you, I pray. Just anoint every part of it, I pray. And we will be careful to give you the praise and the glory for it all. Because it all rightfully belongs to you. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I, without any further... Oh, the children. If children are wanting to go downstairs with their worship, then you're free to be dismissed at this time and go down with Pastor Barb. And... Uh, if not, you, you can stay in here and watch this. But what a delight to have uh, Randy Davis. And I, we, we were, I was trying to figure out, I couldn't remember, and he has records of it somewhere. But back probably in 95, 1995, was when I first met Randy Davis. And um, just, I've appreciated his ministry ever since. And uh, you, you will too, I know you will. Let's give him a good welcome. Randy Davis, come and join us. Well, I'd like to begin by thanking the pastor for inviting me to come and share my uh, ministry here this morning. I appreciate you coming out. And before I get into the program, I wanted uh, to give a little introduction about my family and so on. I have some photos here. This is my wife, Shirley, and our daughter, Wendy. Uh, Wendy is kind of our special daughter. She was born with Down syndrome. I'm sure most of you know what that is. And in kind of a in way of a prayer request, Wendy, uh, in the summer of 2017, she had a stroke, and we ended up at Mayo Clinic up in Minnesota for almost that whole summer. And she spent some time in a wheelchair using a walker, couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't eat, drink, and all that normally. But she is much better. She went through their rehab program. Well, then the next year, we had to go back to Mayo Clinic, and she had heart surgery there, a real difficult heart surgery. This is her cardiologist up at Mayo Clinic, and this is the surgeon who did this real difficult operation. But she was able to get through it, and she went through uh, cardiac rehab after that. And she's improved, but still, still has some issues, kind of has an eye issue going on now. But if you think of Wendy, you might remember to pray for her in the days ahead. She is doing a lot better. She uh, almost looks like a different person now compared to just a couple of years ago. But uh, when we went through all this, we had... Uh, just to give a little background, we had a St. Bernard dog who had passed away. 
And so when Wendy got through all this, she wanted to get a new St. Bernard puppy. And so we said, well, if you, you know, we get through all this, we'll think about it. Well, we did get one uh, three years ago. And the other day, Wendy asked me where I was going next. So I was telling her where I was going. And she, she's real funny. But she says, well, are you going to tell all the people about our St. Bernard? And I said, well, I guess I can. So this is Henry J. And uh, he, was only, uh, he was only a year old in this picture. And now he's three, so he's even bigger. And this gives you a, a little idea of how much bigger he is. Uh, that's, that's actually me back there. That's my right, my right hand. There might be another one here, um, but uh, so um, he's a good boy, but this way I can tell Wendy, and his name is Henry J, and I'll, uh, I'll be able to tell her I told you about that, but I have been doing this ministry for a number of years ago, uh, years now. I started back in 1987. These are some of the states that I've shared uh, presentations in over the years. Also, uh, I'm available, of course, for Sunday worship services. I also do uh, special meetings through the week sometimes. A church will schedule like a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, where I do a different drawing, a different program at each service. I sometimes go to churches for banquets and other, other special events. We have a website if you just go to chalkartist.com. You can learn a little bit more about our ministry and how we got into this unique type of work. Now, um, just in way of explanation, what I generally do in a presentation is before I do the chalk drawing that will be a little bit later up on this easel, I try to share um, some kind of a message uh, from the Bible. I mean, I don't really consider myself to be like... A, you know, a preacher, a pastor. I mean, I, I really look at myself as more of a layman, even though there isn't such a thing as a full-time layman, I guess. But it's kind of interesting because as I travel around to churches, sometimes it's a little bit comical to hear how I'm introduced. I mean, they'll get up, they might call me Reverend Randy Davis, Bible teacher Randy Davis, uh, I don't know, Evangelist Randy Davis, down in Florida a couple of years ago, I was at a church, and the pastor got up and introduced me as Randy Travis, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, another time, we were at a church on a Sunday morning. This was in Iowa, and a lot of people was there. And I remember the pastor came up this center aisle, and the platform was up pretty high, and he got up there. And I guess he got a little tongue-tied, too, because... Um, he said, let's all make welcome this morning from Ottumwa, Iowa. We were living in Iowa at that time. We live in Branson now. But he says, let's all make welcome today from Ottumwa, Iowa, con artist Randy Davis. And, uh, of course, uh, everybody laughed like you did. But he thought he said chalk artist. And he thought, well, what's so funny about chalk artist? And then somebody said, you called him a con artist. So... But anyway, I do try to be a chalk artist, as you'll see a little later in the presentation, but I can assure you I'm not a con artist, so you don't have to worry about that while I'm here. Well, I've decided this morning, before I do the drawing, uh, I try to share um, some kind of a message. It might center around a story in the Bible, maybe a principle in the Bible, or maybe just a section of verses, and I try to illustrate it by using photographs and diagrams and illustrations. That's one reason I still use an overhead because in some of my programs I, I try to draw out little diagrams that you can't really do on PowerPoint quite as well. But I've decided this morning to look at an area that probably all of us are familiar with and we probably all struggle with. I know I do from time to time. And that is um, establishing priorities in our life. There's a section of scripture in the book of Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus addresses this particular topic 
of establishing priorities. And this is what he said. He said, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. You know, someone has calculated how the average American supposedly spends their time. And there was a, a survey conducted that uh, I noticed one time, and I, I copied it down and they called it the average 70-year lifespan. Now, obviously, people today live to be much older than 70, 80. My dad turned 90 last week. I, we knew a lady uh, that was 107 who just passed away. Uh, but they just went up to 70, and somehow they tried to determine how we divide up our time. And I found this kind of interesting and thought I'd just pass it along. They said that in a 70-year lifespan, 23 years of that 70 were actually asleep. About a third of our lifespan. Now, hopefully, no one will be doing that during the service. Of course, the lights will be out later, so... Uh, 16 full years is devoted to our work or occupation. Um, eight years of time, believe it or not, is spent watching television. Six years of time is taken up by something I'm sure we all enjoy, none other than, uh, none other than eating. Another six years of time is taken up by various types of travel. The average person in a 70-year lifespan will devote uh, about four and a half years to leisure activities, while we may spend up to four years suffering from some kind of an illness or disease. And then kind of a humorous fact, they determined that the average person in a 70-year lifespan will actually spend two entire years of their life just dressing, you know, <laughs> putting our clothes on every day, changing them the next day, hopefully. And then the most alarming statistic to me in this survey is that in the average 70-year lifespan, a person devotes only about six months or 0.5 years to what they referred to as quote-unquote religion, making a total of 70 years or 100%. Now, it's obvious we have to spend a certain amount of time on on 
some of these things. I mean, we have to spend uh, a certain amount of time sleeping. We have to work to earn a living. We have to eat to survive, of course. But when you stop and think about it, priorities are not really determined by how much time you spend on them, but by how difficult it would be to distract you from fulfilling them. But still, I often wonder, when all of our lives come to an end, someday what kind of story will our lives tell will our lives reflect God honoring priorities or would we be wise maybe even here this morning to begin thinking of some ways that we could adjust how we've been spending our time now, when we talk about this uh, whole topic of priorities, one of the first things that we have to come to grips with is we have to realize that everyone does have a set of priorities. Now, we may not talk about it, discuss it with other people, but we all have priorities. And one of the things Jesus did in these verses that I just read is he helps these people way back in Bible times to identify what their existing priorities were. And that's what we should try and do this morning, just kind of for fun in the back of our mind privately to try and identify our priorities according to some of these things that the Lord talked about. Now, you may have noticed in these verses, Jesus kept saying, now, don't worry about this, don't worry about this, don't worry about all these other things. You see, when we talk about worrying or anxiety, we're really talking about our priorities in a way because the anxieties that we face will help demonstrate what our priorities are. Now, these people years ago, they were discussing a number of areas that are still quite relevant today in the year 2022. They were discussing things like their food, their fitness, their fashion, their finances. I mean, this almost sounds like topics you would see on a late night infomercial on TV. Now the Lord isn't saying that these kind of things are just irrelevant or unimportant. In fact, he's clearly stating that they do have their proper place. But what he's about to show these people is that it's very easy to get these kind of things in the wrong order of priority. He's pointing out that our anxieties demonstrate our priorities, and sometimes our priorities are simply wrong. Another area that Jesus spoke with these people had to do with their activities in life because our activities will also demonstrate our priorities. Now here's a, a general rule for you which means uh, it's uh, generally true. You might be able to find specific exceptions on occasion but the general rule is this, and that is we can always seem to find the time to do what we really want to do. We can always seem to find the time to do those things that we really 
want to do. Now then, if this is true, the things that we do, the things that we regard as the things that we really have to get done, then we can always find time for our priorities. Thirdly, Jesus spoke to these people about their ambitions in life because our ambitions is all also something that will help demonstrate our priorities. Now he means here something that is very compelling. They've established it as a goal and they're really going after it. Now to a, a greater or lesser degree, most people have ambitions in life. Now sometimes we think of maybe people in high school or college as having ambitions but you know, uh, people of all ages can have ambitions, even elderly people. Maybe they want to be something or do something or go somewhere. Maybe they want to have something. These would be our ambitions. And whenever we are ambitious for something to the extent that we've kind of set it up as a goal and we're really going for it, then that would be a priority. So if we want to identify our priorities, and we really should, we can do it fairly easily by identifying the anxieties that we currently face, and of course, they vary from person to person, then identifying the activities that we are presently involved in, as well as identifying our ambitions. Now, once we've done that, the second thing, which is a little more difficult, and that is from time to time, the Lord teaches us to evaluate our priorities. Now, um, the Lord makes it very clear that it's all too easy for us to become more concerned with secondary things rather than primary things. We might call it majoring on the minors. Um, we can get things that may not really be all that important in a very important place. In his book, Tyranny of the Urgent, a man by the name of Charles Hummel wrote this. He said, our greatest danger in life is letting the urgent things crowd out the important. And how true that is. I mean, we all live in constant tension between the urgent things in our life as opposed to those things that may be truly important. Now, sometimes when I evaluate my own priorities, I discover that some of them are wrong or maybe just out of order. Well, of course, in verse 33 of this popular chapter in the Bible, a verse that many Christians have committed to memory, it's that verse that says, uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Now, you probably recall the time in the New Testament when Jesus spoke to that man whose name was uh, Nicodemus. Now, Nicodemus was a highly respected, upper-class government official. He was a ruler of the Jews, a very religious man, and he had a lot of questions for the Lord about eternity and the new birth, how a person gets into heaven. And so they met one night up on a rooftop in Jerusalem, and they were discussing a number of areas. And in the book of John, you may remember, Jesus said something very interesting to Nicodemus. He said, except a person be born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, I submit to you, if the kingdom of God is the top priority, I mean, Jesus said that all, all of us should put that in first place, then we need to be very certain, we need to be for sure as human beings living today in the year 2022, 
to that we have experienced it it ourselves. You see, according to Jesus, we must experience the kingdom. It's not just like an option that we can consider. Now, when we talk about a kingdom, we might say a kingdom is a realm in which the king functions with authority. You see, in a kingdom, the king is the one who's in charge. Those living in the kingdom must submit to him. Well, in much the same way in our Christian life, I guess to put it in the simplest terms I know how, the very top priority for each and every one of us here today is to be sure Jesus is our Savior and Lord. You know, many people today across the nation, across the world, they're far more concerned about, you know, the weather, the economy, their favorite sports team, you know, whatever it might be, giving very very little thought to whether Jesus is actually their Lord and Savior. Now, once we have experienced the kingdom, once we've pressing the kingdom to the, those around us, which might be friends, family, uh, co-workers, classmates, uh, various people that we work with. The Apostle Paul put it this way when writing to the Corinthians. He said, when I came and talked with you people I reminded you that the kingdom of God is not a lot of words the kingdom of God is power and then in Romans 14 17 it says for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit you see at some point in life we have to come to the place of making a commitment as to whether we are going to accept Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and what he went through for us. You may remember in Acts 16, there's a, a verse that says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. In other words, uh, do we believe in him or do we believe on him? I mean, all of us here probably believe in Abraham Lincoln, but not on him. I mean, we don't trust our life to him. And there's a world of difference between believing in in something and believing on something. But as we express the kingdom to others, finally then Jesus teaches us, I guess we could refer to it as extending the kingdom. I mean, how can we say that we seek first the kingdom if we do not take seriously the fact that the good news of the kingdom is supposed to be proclaimed all over the world. So what's the priority? Well, Jesus used the little phrase, seek first the kingdom in terms of, first of all, experiencing it, then being involved in expressing it, as well as extending it. Now, to extend the kingdom doesn't mean everybody has to quit their job and move to a 
foreign country and be a missionary or something. It might mean that for some people, but for others, um, I'm sure most of us here could probably extend the kingdom a little more aggressively. Just right in the own, our, the own neighborhood in which we live. You know, um, I sometimes think of life as uh, being a wheel, like one of those old wooden wagon wheels that you might see on an Amish buggy. I was driving home from a meeting a while back, and I passed a couple of these buggies kind of over on the shoulder of the highway. And as I went by, I began to think of an illustration we might call the wheel of life. And this so-called wheel of life has three parts. The spokes of the wheel could represent all of our duties and responsibilities in life. The hub of the wheel could represent Jesus. I mean, if we're a, um, a born-again Christian, we're a, a Christ follower, someone who tries, strives to follow the teachings of Scripture, Jesus should be the center of our life, we might say the hub of our wheel. Well, then the third part of the wheel is the rim that goes all the way around the perimeter. And unfortunately, the rim of the wheel is where many of us have a tendency to live our daily life. And what often occurs is we, uh, we run around or we race around the rim of this wheel in an attempt to get to all of these spokes in our life, all of these duties and responsibilities. And again, these would vary from person to per person. But many times we find that racing around this circle that uh, we come up empty. I mean, we are always failing to reach all these spokes in our life. Of course, Jesus tells us there in Matthew 11, 28 to 30, he said, uh, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He then said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, whenever we draw closer to the Lord, whenever we live our life on the hub of the wheel rather than up here on the rim, so to speak, you will find that the circle you now have to run in life in order to reach all of these spokes, you'll find that circle to be much shorter now and our duties can be accomplished with greater ease. In fact, in verse 30, Jesus said, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, most Christians today in our culture spend a certain amount of time devoted to worship. A certain amount of time is devoted to their work or occupation, unless you're already retired. And then uh, often an amount of time is allotted for what we could call play or recreation. So we can see here on the screen our 
our worship, our work, and our play. But you know, a trap that is so easy to fall into, and I found that especially in our culture today, it seems that so many have a tendency to instead worship their work, they work at their play, and then just sort of play at their worship. Have you ever uh, woken up like in the middle of the night, maybe felt kind of nauseated, and you stumble out to the kitchen and you look for some of that in the refrigerator, some of that uh, famous pink medicine that we've probably all used. I, had, I was at Walgreen the other day to get a prescription for Wendy, and I had to wait a minute. I was kind of just, you know, looking at stuff, and I noticed um, that these kind of products that on the back, it always says in big letters, shake well before using. And the reason it says that is because uh, the active ingredients in these kind of products have a way of settling to the bottom, and so they want you to shake it really good before you use it. Well, in much the same way, it seems that our top priorities in life always have a way of settling to the bottom of our everyday activities. And so, uh, if we find ourselves from time to time being shaken, I mean, maybe God is just realigning our priorities. Maybe he's about to use us in an amazing way. Maybe he's shaking you before using you. And again, the things that we looked at earlier, just briefly, things like our food, our fitness, our fashion, our finances, even our families. Again, these things are not, not unimportant. It's just that according to Jesus, they are less important than seeking first the kingdom. You see the message that Jesus is conveying through these scriptures today is really quite simple yet profound. What he's teaching us is He's saying, first the kingdom, and then all these other things in life, he'll take care of. Well, right now, I'd like to do a drawing for you up here on the easel. If someone could go ahead and shut all the lights out. I appreciate those who covered the windows with those uh, nice-looking curtains. I told the pastor, most churches use black plastic, so these... These look quite a bit better. But the reason um, the room has to be fairly dark is so that the picture will show up uh, properly at the end. It has to be fairly dark for it to show up. And I have a cover over the front of my easel that I'll be removing. And behind the cover, I have. Uh, some of the background of the picture started, so it doesn't take quite as long to finish. And if you need to move around to see better, it won't bother me at all if you move around. Um, and as the music plays, if you recognize any of the songs or choruses, if if you want to sing along, you can do that, or if you just want to listen, that's fine. And then after I uh, finish the drawing, I'll come back to the podium here for just uh, a couple of closing comments and one final song. So you watch and listen, and I trust that the Lord might use 
manifested it in a special way in each one of our lives. Not a single sparrow falls that he doesn't see. How much more does the Father care for you? And he knows he each thing.
shall fall astray as the vision grew dim. The answer came from him. How many will you show? When they nailed my Jesus there, I wasn't there when they pierced his side, placed a 
is a lot like going on a journey. The journey of life, of course, has two different roads and two different destinations. In fact, in the chapter right after the one we looked at a moment ago, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, uh, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. 
The drawing today is kind of a simple illustration of those two roads. On the left represents the broad road, the wider road that Jesus said most people choose to follow because it's wider, it's downhill, it's easier. Most people are going that way. But eventually, he said, that road leads to destruction. Then in the next verse, he said, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, the person in the foreground is to represent someone at a crossroads in life, trying to determine what their priority is going to be. You see, there's not multiple roads to heaven, as the general public would have us believe. There's only one road, and in the Greek, Jesus called it uh, stenos, meaning difficult or narrow. And the narrow road is illustrated over on the right side of the picture, and this is the road that may be more treacherous, more curvy, more challenging, but this is the road that eventually leads to the foot of the cross and eternal life in heaven. You see, uh, Jesus is not just one of the ways. He's not the best of several ways. He said that he is the only way. You see, everyone today, it seems to me, is looking for a Savior. I don't know they, that they really recognize that, but many people will look to their occupation as their savior. Maybe they turn to drugs, alcohol, sports, money, fame, maybe some cult, maybe some new God that the culture offers them. One thing very popular today is some of the new age face that Hollywood has made quite prevalent. Even when you look back in the Old Testament, I was reading the other day back in the book of Isaiah, and we read scriptures like this, Isaiah 43, 11. It says, I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. In chapter 45, he said, look unto me and be saved, for I am God, and there is no other. I'm sure many of you here today are familiar with the I am statements Jesus made in the book of John when he said, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the true vine. And then Luke recorded the words of Peter there in Acts 4.12 when he said, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now perhaps you're thinking, well, you know, I've already taken that narrow road that leads to the foot of the cross, and I've been a believer for many years, and I, I trust that's the case. But I wonder, what about our priorities in life? I mean, is Jesus actually first, or is he second, or third, or fourth? Maybe we are at a crossroads today with some of our anxieties or activities or ambitions. As I play one final song this morning, let's allow the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and minds and perhaps uh, instill within us some ideas, some ways that we could adjust how we've been spending our time and, and maybe just realign our priorities uh, to be a little bit more in tune with God's will. This final song is appropriately entitled, Dying for Me. From 
the cross on Calvary's hill, there's a cry that echoes still. Father, why has thou forsaken me? He could have said and free that day, but instead he walked away. Sunder dying for me. He was dying for me. He left him dying for me. Did he see in me to leave him dying for me? He shunned an innocent voice. Instead, he made. Said that I could go free, left his son on a tree, dying for me.
picture that has now been revealed is, of course, one that I drew earlier with a special type of chalk that they refer to as invisible fluorescent chalk, and so I did this drawing in the dark under a black light. And the drawing today is to illustrate in a, in a simple way what our options or what our choices in life are. You see, we can either choose to follow the crowd down the broad road through the sin gate that is so appealing, or by faith, we can choose to follow the narrow road that leads to the foot of the cross. But you know, we should always remember this, and that is that our success in life is not determined by the dreams that we dream, but by the choices that we make. Certainly nothing wrong with having a dream or kind of a goal in life. But our success was, will always be determined by the choices that we make. Now, if I were to draw you or me into this picture this morning, where would we fit? You see, all of us in this room today would fit somewhere in the drawing because either we're following the crowd down the broad road Road, or we're already on the narrow road because we've made an on-purpose commitment to Christ. Now, sometimes people will say, well, um, I'm more like this person in the foreground. I'm just kind of at the crossroad, at the fork, I guess. I've never, never really decided which path, which road that I'm going to follow. But you know, So if you study the New Testament, you will find that uh, you are either for Christ or you are against Christ. There's really nothing in the middle. Even though many Americans would like to be in the green circle, Jesus basically tells us there is no middle because we're either for him or against him. If you look at the drawing, you'll see there's only two options. I mean, there's not a third road, a third exit. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, I've always heard God is supposed to be so loving and forgiving, so I figure I have... you know, just as good a chance of getting to heaven as all these hypocrites that claim to be Christians. But we have to remember that this idea that God is so merciful and loving that everyone is somehow mystically, magically going to make it into heaven, it's totally false. There's nothing about that in the Bible. Instead, what Scripture teaches us is that if we want to experience the kingdom, if we want to get on that narrow road, the first thing we must do is we must be willing to admit to God that we have sinned. We also must be willing to honestly repent of our sin. Sometimes Sometimes that step is overlooked today in gospel presentations. Obviously, we must believe in Christ's power to save us. And then at some point, we have to kind of nail it down and ask him to come into our heart and life. Romans 10, 13 says, Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so as I close this morning... I'd like to put a little simple prayer up on the screen, and I want to make clear that just reciting a prayer is not what saves us. I mean, trusting in Christ does that. 
But prayer is how we tell God what it is we want to do. And there might even be someone here today and you'd like to just silently pray this prayer as I go over it out loud. But this is a prayer. Thank you, God, for loving me and sending your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for me. Right now, I do receive him and ask you to cleanse me of all my sin. Thank you for raising him up from the dead as a living Savior, and thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. You know the good news of the gospel that we just celebrated recently on Easter, and really we celebrate it every Sunday. The good news is that Jesus didn't remain on that cross or in the tomb, but he victoriously arose three days later. And the Bible says that when we personally accept his sacrifice and we're willing to take these steps, that we can be adopted into the family of God and we can have the assurance of a home in heaven someday. Let's just close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as the pastor comes now to kind of wrap up our service, we just commit this day to you. We pray that your Holy Spirit would direct each of us into the appropriate response, whatever that might be. We desire to draw closer to you today in some form or fashion so that we might be a greater reflection of your son, Jesus, in the days that lie ahead. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Xavier. Amen. Well, if our ushers will come as we said, thank you, Randy, for sharing with us that. And did that surprise you when that showed up? <laughs> and that drawing there today? And, uh, wow. Well, and the, and the message to be able to illustrate that message. Um, it just makes it, makes it plain for us, doesn't it? Lord, we just give you, we bring to you for our, our, for our gifts to go for the ministry of Randy. And we're thankful that he, you use him in this unique way to give your message we decide to take, as we sing the song and when we are baptized and we talk about, we have decided to follow Jesus. We, we truly want to do that. So Lord, I pray that you would bless our gifts that we give to Randy and you would multiply them for their intended purpose of expanding the kingdom of God. Anoint him, be with him in his ministry and as he travels, keep your hand upon him. I pray. And Lord, for what you do, we will give you the praise for it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.